those of you watching uh, this on YouTube right now, thank you again for spending some time to watch this video, whether it's live or whether it's later on in the recording or the audio recording. Um, thank you. If you have any comments, questions, please leave them in the comment section. Um, also, you can do that by visiting our website. We, uh, we're so thankful that, you know, we, that you're here and that you're watching. So with that, I'll go ahead and begin with today's message. And I uh, titled today's message, The Journey Back Home. Now, this is a continuation of last week's message. I was only, uh, my intent last week was to uh, read and cover all of chapter 19. But um, I covered a lot, just in the, fir in the first 23 verses. And my intent now is to um, complete chapter 19. And then afterwards, we are going to have a time of communion. So, um, you know, again, hopefully um, after this message, your heart will be ready for that. Um, last week, we began to cover the five steps David took to bring about the healing of the nation. He's, his son Absalom is dead. He is now the undisputed king of Israel. And he now needs to make his way back to Jerusalem. <clears throat> but it, while he's doing that, he needs to... He's, He's taking these steps to begin unifying the nation. Because after so many years of, of all this stuff, all this turmoil going on inside the nation, there's been a lot of friction, a lot of intertribal problems going on, and he needs to remain focused and bring the nation together. Something that I hope that one day um, we'll be able to have here in our own country a leader that will bring our nation together because we are so splintered right now. There's so many issues and problems that this nation, our nation, is completely divided. Well, here again, we're going to look at the last three steps, um, the last two steps that David took. Now, in the first 23 verses, we covered the, of chapter 19, we covered the first three steps. The first step that David took <clears throat> was to realign his perspective. Because of his intense grief for his son Absalom, David, the father, forgot that he was also David the king and that he still had a responsibility to the nation. So we saw how with the assistance of his commander, Joab, David realigned his perspective by letting go of what he wanted to do to do what he needed to do. Now the lesson there was the importance of maintaining a proper perspective during difficult times and especially during periods of depression. And the only way we can do this, we saw last week, is by keeping our eyes on the cross, by keeping our eyes on Jesus and remembering the reasons that God sent his son here to earth. And the second step we saw last week was that, he, that David took to bring the healing of the nation was to strive. He strove for unity. He did this by seeking the cooperation of his familial tribe, the tribe of Judah, in order to get the support of the other tribes. He also made an executive decision by replacing his commander Joab with Amasa as his top general which signified to the military branch that he was now pardoning all those who had supported 
all the military troops that had supported Absalom's rebellion. This step that David took showed that leaders will often be required to make difficult and unpopular decisions for the sake of unity and harmony. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And the third step he took to bring about healing that we covered last week was his declaration of general amnesty. <clears throat> By not pursuing Shimei, Shimei's public display of disrespect, and we'll see more of this later on, but Ziba's manipulative dishonesty. David was showing the entire kingdom his willingness to forgive. He wanted to show everyone that his goal to bring unity and peace to a divided nation was for them not to be scared anymore. They don't have to fear. They don't have to be fearful of the consequences because they had supported Absalom. In that step there, David exemplified the principle that it's better to forgive those that have wronged us, wronged you, than to hold a grudge against them. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, whenever I see myself before God and realize something of what my blessed Lord has done for me at Calvary, I'm ready to forgive anybody anything. I cannot withhold it. I don't even want to withhold it. Well, now this week, we're going to finish off chapter 19 and look at the final two steps David took to bring about healing. And we're also going to draw, draw out some, some lessons that we can learn from those two steps. So before we begin reading the last half of Chapter 19, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before you right now and ask you to just pour your spirit upon this room, Lord, so that everyone here will, everyone here will hear your word, will see your word, will it, that it will come alive, that the seed, again, of your word will be implanted deeply in the minds and hearts of everyone here, Lord. I pray for those watching and listening for, to this later on, Lord, that you also bless them and speak to them, Lord, whether it's here locally or maybe somewhere around the world, Lord. May your word go forth for what it was designed to do, Lord. Change lives, change hearts, change marriages, change perspectives, Lord. So now speak again powerfully through what we're about to read here, Lord, and show us what it is that we all need to know as a church and what we need to know individually. Bless this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Second Samuel chapter 19, and I'm going to begin in verse 24. Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, also went down to meet the king. He had not taken care of his feet, trimmed his mustache, or washed his clothes from the day the king left until the day he returned safely. When he came from Jerusalem to meet the king, the king asked him, Mephibosheth, why didn't you come with me? My lord, the king, he replied, my servant Ziba betrayed me. Actually, your servant said, I'll saddle the donkey for myself so that I may ride it and go with the king, for your servant is lame. Ziba slandered your servant to my lord the king, but my lord the king is like the angel of God, so do whatever you think is best, for my grandfather's entire family deserves death from my lord the king, but you set your servant among those who eat at your table. So what further right do I have to keep on making appeals to the king? The king said to him, why keep on speaking about these matters of yours? I hereby declare you and Ziba are to divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Instead, since my lord the king has come to this 
palace safely. Let Zeba take it all. Brazilite, the Gileadite, had come down from Roglim and accompanied the king to the Jordan River to see him off at the Jordan. Barzil Barzillai was a very old man, 80 years old. And since he was a very wealthy man, he had provided for, he had provided for the needs of the king while he stayed in Mahanim. The king said to Barzillai, cross over with me and I'll provide for you at my, I'll provide for you at my side in Jerusalem. Barzillai replied to the king, how many years of my life are left that I should go up to Jerusalem with the king? I'm now 80 years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or drinks? Can I still hear the voice of a male and female singers? Why should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Since your servant is only going, since your servant is only going with the king a little way across the Jordan, why should the king repay me with such reward? Please let your servant return so that I may die in my own city, near the tomb of my father and mother. But here is your servant, uh, Chimham. Let him cross over with my lord, the king. Do for him whatever seems good to you. The king replied, Chimham will cross over with me, and I will do for him what seems good to you. And whatever you desire for me, I will do for you. So while the people crossed the Jordan, and then the king crossed the king kissed Brazili and blessed him, and Brazili returned to his home. The king went on to Gilgal, and Chimham went with him. All the troops of Judah and half of Israel escorted the king. Suddenly all the men of Israel came to the king. They asked him, why did our brothers, the men of Judah, take you away secretly and transport the king and his household across the Jordan, along with all, with, along with all of David's men? All the men of Judah responded to the men of Israel, because the king is our relative. Why does this make you angry? Have we ever eaten anything of the king's or been honored at all? The men of Israel answered, the men of Judah, we have 10 shares in the king, so we have greater claim to, the, to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Weren't we the first to speak of restoring our king? But the words of the men of Judah were harsher than those of the men of Israel. Now the fourth step, again, continue on from last week. The fourth step David took here was to correct a terrible, huge mistake that he had made. Now back in chapter 9, Mephibosheth, the lame prince, had basically been adopted into David's household and permitted to eat at the king's table. A gift from David in honor of Jonathan, Mephibosheth's father, and David's beloved friend. When David had become king of all Israel, he inherited, basically he inherited everything that had belonged to the former king, to Saul, including his land. And some of that land he turned over to Mephibosheth to help support him and his family. At that time, David also commanded Saul's servant Ziba to care for the land and to obey Mephibosheth, which he promised to do. But when David was escaping from Jerusalem, Ziba showed up without his master, Mephibosheth, and brought help to David and his people, much needed supplies. Now at that time, we read in chapter 16 that David made an impulsive decision and gave all the land to Ziba. Well, we read last week that Ziba once again shows up here. Uh, well, last week he had shown up to help David on his trip back home. But like, like the last time, there's no Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is absent from the picture. Mephibosheth's presence, therefore, meant 
that despite his disability, you remember again, he was dropped when he was an infant, he became disabled. Um, but despite that disability, he traveled more than 20 miles, 20 to 25 miles from Jerusalem to the Jordan River without the help of his assistant or his helpers, Ziba. See, he needed to get there as quickly as possible, no matter what. No matter if he had to crawl, no matter if he had to, you know, uh, had to ride several donkeys or, you know, had to find some other wild animal, he had to get to David as soon as possible. See, he knew that Ziba had slandered him. He knew that Ziba had lied to David by telling him that he hoped that the rebellion would succeed and that the crown uh, would be returned eventually back to the house of Saul. Mephibosheth wanted an opportunity to speak to David personally, deny Ziba's lies, and affirm his allegiance to the king, all of which he did. So when he approached David, he told him the truth. The fact that he repeatedly addressed David several times here as my lord, the king, it revealed his heart. It really revealed his sincerity and his loyalty to him. But the more David listened to Mephibosheth's explanation, he realized that he had made a huge mistake by jumping the gun and giving Ziba all the land. But because of everything that was going on, everything that was happening at the time, he was trying to escape, he was leaving. Um, he didn't have time to conduct a hearing to settle the matter. But Mephibosheth made it clear that he wasn't asking the king for anything. The king had already given him a new life. He already put him at the, at his, at the king's table. So what more was there to desire? To paraphrase his speech, I have more than what I deserve, so why should I seek the throne? I was destined to die, and you not only saved me, but took me into your own family circle. David's response isn't easy to understand. On the surface, he seemed to be saying, there's no need to go into the matter again. You and Ziba divide the land. See, David was a man of his word. But he was also a smart negotiator. He was also a smart diplomat. He knew that doing something kind to Mephibosheth would have pleased the 1,000 Benjamites who came to the Jordan to welcome David. And it also would have strengthened David's ties with both the tribe of Benjamin, which was, again, Saul's tribe, and the 10 tribes that had originally followed the house of Saul had he not done anything, had he just left the matter as is and say and as, had said, you know what, Mephibosheth, I'm sorry. It is what it is. I, I can't undo what I did. My word is my bond, and I can't, I can't change it. Had he not done anything, it would have put a damper on the joyful and forgiving atmosphere that was occurring, that had been occurring that entire day. So when he proclaimed that the land would be divided, he accomplished a couple things. He was essentially forgiving Ziba for his lies and treachery. And in a way, he was also taking the easy way out. But Mephibosheth's reply must have just completely stunned David. Let me read to you again what 
he said in verse 30, he told him, instead, since my lord the king has come to his palace, let Ziba take it all. Here's the thing. Ziba already had it all. And if you think about it, the situation here reminds us of the case of the dead, of the dead baby that Solomon had to solve in 1 Kings chapter 3. See, there, when he offered to divide the living baby, the child's true mother protested. And that's how Solomon discovered her identity. Now, unlike the living baby, land isn't harmed when it's divided. But perhaps David was testing Mephibosheth's, Mephibosheth to see where his heart was. Well, the text doesn't go on to tell us how David responded. But maybe, just maybe, perhaps Mephibosheth did receive all the land as the original contract. Either way, the lame prince was cared for as Ziba worked the land. Now, did David make or do the right thing by giving Ziba everything that he had given to Mephibosheth? Well, at this point, we can say no. We know what really happened. We've read the story. We can say that you know, David acted too hastily. He didn't stop and think. He didn't do the right thing. But remember, David is living it. This is what he's experienced. At that time, David had already seen his own son and his trusted advisor, Ahithophel, and probably many others, who, too, that aren't named here. Many close people that he thought were friends turn their back on him, betray him, and follow Absalom's rebellion. So, again, his son and his, one of his most trusted advisors betrayed him. So at the time, he probably thought about it and said, oh, Mephibosheth, too. You know what? Ziba, go ahead. Just take it all. Take all his land. But he wasn't thinking. He was so caught up in the moment with the stress, with the anxiety, with the thoughts of his son, the thoughts of his people, the, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that he just told him to take it all. The lesson we can learn from this is the importance of carefully thinking about things before making a decision that is going to require further investigation. Now, because of my profession, because of what I do outside the church, I've been trained and know that I've got to look at all the facts of an incident, of a situation before making a decision. I just can't go out and make an arrest because I feel like it, because I don't like the way someone looks. I've got to see it with my own eyes. I gotta have reasonable suspicion. I gotta have all these things. I gotta, I gotta make sure I have these articulable facts that I can write on paper, document. I just can't take someone's word to tell me, hey, that person uh, did something illegal, you gotta arrest them. No, I can't do that. And so I've been trained that way. Even prior to that, you know, in military, you know, you just have that mindset. Know all the facts before you go out and do something. You don't wanna you know, do something dumb. It's gonna cost your life, it's gonna cost you your life or the life of others. Again, if I'm not careful now with my current job, if I'm not careful with what I do, I can get to, into a lot 
of legal issues, legal problems. I can get arrested myself. If not, I can get sued. Um, all kinds of things can happen. So that's always on my mind. Now, I believe, I say that because I believe that if David had really taken the time to consider all the facts, all the information, such as who was giving him that information, obviously at this time David knew there was something sketchy about Ziba. You know, he was there without Mephibosheth one prior time, um, and now again he had been, he was there again without him. And also, he should have really thought about Mephibosheth. He had, I think that by now he would have spent enough time dining with him at his table, knowing him personally, having conversations with him, to really know what was in his heart, to really know him and to really think about whether Mephibosheth would really do something like that. Now, Again, I think most of you, you have close people that are near and dear to you that you wouldn't imagine in a million years that they would betray you. And so if someone told you that they did, that they did betray you, would you just take their word for them? Especially if, especially if they were sketchy people, if they were known to be liars, they were known to be shady people. I think that you would take the time, right? You would take the time to just not make a decision, not do something crazy that you're going to regret later on, and just wait. And just wait till you get both sides of the story. So I'm sure that David here is now kicking himself in the butt. I, I don't know about you know, some of you, but sometimes when I think back of the bad choices and decisions I've made, I'm like, I, I do let out like a groan, like, oh, man. I, I don't know why I'm thinking about it, but I regret that so bad. Well, here I think that David is, is doing that. Um, but again, had he really examined all the facts, he would have waited until everything was done, until this entire, until he was back in Jerusalem, to investigate the entire situation. Or he would have told Ziba the first time, hey, you know what? Hold off, hold on. Let me pray about it, let me think about it, let me consider this. Let me send a messenger to Mephibosheth. Millions of things he could have done differently. But man, you could just tell from that chapter when he was going through that, there was a lot going on. So he made a wrong choice. He made a, a, a rash decision. But again, it, it turned out for the best. You know, um, Again, uh, David was able to see Mephibosheth's heart. He saw that he didn't want anything. To, for him, all that sitting at the king's table, all that food, all that music, all that didn't matter to him. It didn't, it didn't matter to him. What mattered to him is that David gave him new life. He thought he was going to spend the rest of his life in a small shack, crippled, to be forgotten, never to be helped out, to starve to death. But no, David gave him new life, gave him a new opportunity. So that's what mattered to him the most. So many people, maybe some of you have been hurt or wronged because the entire story of a situation of something bad that really happened hadn't been looked at or considered. 
on a bigger level, wars have begun because of assumptions. New religions have, were, have risen up because of assumptions, because people believing certain things about our Lord Jesus or about God or about you know, faith and about the universe, you know, it, all kinds of religions, denomination, Christian denominations, divorces, <coughs> marriages have broken up because of assumptions, friendships, and even church splits. Maybe you've gone through something like that. And so I hope that if you have, that now you've learned the best thing to do is to hear the entire story. It's important that you put your feelings and your emotions aside and consider the entire bigger picture. Now, share something that maybe the, you know, my, I don't know if my wife has shared it, but when we were going through our problems, many people told her to leave me. I'm just going to, I'm not going to change, I'm gonna keep messing up, keep doing the same stuff over and over. But she, rather than saying, yeah, yeah, okay, I believe you, yeah, you know, you're right, you're right, you're right. No, she stopped, really prayed about it. In spite of everyone around her telling her what she needed to do, what she ought to do, she sought the Lord and asked him what she should do. And as a result of that, still here, you know, still together, still sleeping in the same bed, you know, we're not sleeping in separate rooms, you know, and our love has grown much stronger because she trusted in the Lord. So again, my, my point is, stop. Think and pray. Don't let others influence your decision. Pray about it. Seek the Lord. Seek his word. I'm not saying that you ought to open up any page in the Bible and you're going to get the answer there. No, it's, it comes from just reading it, reading, you know, it could be anything, you know, in the New Testament, Old Testament. It could be from hearing the word being preached, a message from what's being read. Um, it's all what kinds of ways he can speak to you. Maybe he's telling you that right now because you're at the point of making a decision without really praying about it and seeking the Lord. So if that's the case, then maybe he's telling you right now. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart right now telling you to stop and just pray and seek him out. Don't do something that's going to affect your life and others as well. Again, let me reiterate the lesson there. Stop and pray. Consider all the facts and both sides of the story. Now, the last step David took in this chapter to heal and unite the nation was by him rewarding the faithful. In chapter 17, Brazilii was one of three wealthy landowners who met David when he arrived at Mahanim, and uh, together, all three of them supplied David's needs, his troops' needs, all his officials, everybody that came with him out of Jerusalem, he supplied their needs. We're told here that he was a wealthy individual. Well, after supplying their needs, he returned home about 20 to 25, 20 to 25 miles north. But when we heard that David was 
victorious in this short civil war and that he was now returning back to Jerusalem in spite of, again, his age, how old he was, he came down as quickly as he could to see him off. Unlike Shimei, who we saw last week, he had no sins to confess, nor was there a misunderstanding to straighten out as with Mephibosheth. Furthermore, he didn't have an agenda, sought no favor, didn't want anything either from the king. All he wanted was to have the joy of sending him off safely, knowing that the war was over. His joy was seeing David cross that river Jordan knowing that he was returning back to Jerusalem. It must have just gave him this huge old man smile with, you know, those pictures with old men have no teeth. You just see their gums and just, he's smiling, seeing, seeing David returning back home. These two trips, going back home and coming back to the river, must have been really hard for a man of 80 years old. But he wanted to give the king his best. Again, as a side note here, it brings to mind, are you doing the same to God, with God? Are you giving him the best? Here you have this 80-year-old man who took that, supplied David's needs, took that 20 to 25 mile trip north, came back south, another 20 to 25 miles, and plus he still had to make that trip back home. Say the maximum 70, 75 miles. For an 80-year-old man walking, I mean a lot of it, again, there's no cars, there's no trains, there's no planes. All of it was, was walking, riding donkeys, um, if you're familiar with the area, a lot of hills and a lot of rocks. And Anyways, it's not an easy journey. Ask yourself, is this 80-year-old man that's giving the best, is he, is he putting you to shame? What are you giving the Lord? Are you giving him your best? Are you giving him what he wants from you? And that's all of you. He wants all of your heart. He doesn't want a divided heart. He doesn't want a divided mind. He wants you to trust him, to believe in him by faith, to trust in his son who came and died for you. He wants you to have that faith of a child. He wants to see you just come to him, not doubt, not like listen to the world and, and believe this or that about God. No, to believe him for who he is, the omnipresent, omniscient, you know, just all powerful Lord God Almighty who was there in the beginning and will be there at the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Are you giving him the best? Well, David wanted to reward Brazili by care, uh, for caring for him, or by taking care of him at his palace in Jerusalem. Kind of wanted to do the same thing he had done for Mephibosheth. And not, not only did David want to express his thanks, but by having an important man in Jerusalem, it would strengthen ties with the people on the other side of the Jordan at this important time in, the healing, in healing and unit, to bring healing and unity. 
he wanted to, you know, he knew that he was an important figure for those peoples that he, he, he belonged to. But, you know, there was, there was a reason and purpose for him, but he also just wanted to, to just show Brazili his, his gratitude. <coughs> but Brazili graciously, graciously refused the offer on the ground that he was basically too old. David, I, I'm not going to be able to hear the music. I'm not going to be able to really enjoy the food. Again, I, you know, I can barely chew. You know, um, at age, he just wanted to just stay home and retire there and just relax and die, where in his familiar surroundings. It's like, hey, I'm good. I'm all right. Thank you. But I'm okay. See, older people don't like to pull up their roots and relocate. And they want to die at home and be buried with their loved ones. At his age, Brazil, I couldn't enjoy the special pleasures of life there at the palace. And it would only be a burden to the king who had already enough to think about enough to do. However, Brazili was willing to let Chimham take his place. And you can read more about him in 1 Kings chapter 2. But he sent him to take his place and to live in Jerusalem for him instead. What Brazili didn't need for himself, he was willing for others to enjoy. Matthew Henry said this, they that are old must not begrudge young people those delights which they themselves are past the enjoyment of, nor oblige them to retire as they do. Let those that can enjoy it, enjoy it. Only you, you know, you know at what age that is. I'm not going to put an age on, on that, but that decision is yours to make. And no one should tell you, you know what, you're too old to, to enjoy this or that. You can tell them to shut up. <laughs> you can tell them, no, that's nonsense. A nicer way of saying it. No, that's nonsense. I can enjoy it, and I will enjoy it. However, you yourself will know, and you know what, I just think it's better if someone else takes my place. And that's what, again, the point of this quote from Matthew Henry. Brazil, I crossed the river with David and Chimham, went a short distance with them, and said goodbye. David affectionately kissed his friend and benefactor. And more than likely, that was the last time that he saw him. But David's troubles weren't over yet. For the long-running feud between the ten tribes of Judah would surface again and almost cause another civil war. And this is, again, the end of the last couple paragraphs of chapter 19. They were bickering now amongst each other about who was more important who had more uh, who had a greater claim to to david it was that animosity again peeking itself out and shakespeare was right when he said uneasy lies the head that wears the crown now this last half gives us some insight into the spiritual condition of the nation at this time in their history. It's hard not to notice Israel's sinfulness in relationship to the king that God had chosen to lead them. First, the nation had demanded a king, and God gave them one with Saul. Then God replaces Saul with David, but David refuses to raise a hand against God's anointed, against Saul. 
And yet, here we read that the tribes of Israel, well, prior to this actually, we find it that it was easier, easy for, for them to follow Absalom and to forsake David as their king in spite of the fact that God had specifically chosen him. They think of their king as someone they own. Someone who was obliged to give them what they want, when they want it. And if he doesn't, then they feel free to reject him. But Israel's rebellion against David is also a rebellion against God. However, we shouldn't make the mistake of assuming that because Israel sinned in rebelling against David, Jude, that Judah is faithful in remaining loyal to God. When the people of Israel are arguing with the people of Judah, the Israelites argue that since they consist of ten tribes, they have ten times the ownership of David, ten times the claim on him. In other words... David was ten times more obliged to them. But when the people of Judah speak uh, of their relationship to David, their claim was that he was family. Yeah, you guys have more, but we're family. Therefore, he's more important to us. There's more of a greater bond thing is, neither of the ten tribes of Israel nor the tribe of Judah speak of David as God's anointed king. Both tribes follow David for self-serving reasons. Thus, Judah is hardly better for following David than the men of Israel are for leaving him. Isn't this true? of all mankind throughout the ages. Ever since the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, he placed them in the Garden of Eden. He gave them the freedom to eat of every tree in the garden, except one, which he prohibited. Well, you know the story. Satan came along and convinced them that if their perception of their needs and uh, uh, convinced them that if their perception of their needs and how to meet them did not square with God's leadership, then they were free to act autonomously, independently of God. And so they did. And from that moment on, Man has rebelled against God's leadership. Now when the Lord Jesus came to the earth, he was God's Messiah, God's anointed one. He was God's king. At first, many followed our Lord, excited about the possibility of his kingdom. But when they learned that his kingdom did not square with what they had hoped for, they renounced him as their king, professing that they had no other king but Caesar. It's the same today. There's a great deal of discussion and debate about the issue of lordship. What is a Lord. What does that mean? But it's difficult to deny that Jesus Christ doesn't just want us to trust him as our Savior, but to obey him as our Lord. To be his slaves, his servant, to be obedient to whatever he says, whether it's hard or not is to trust him, knowing that as our Lord, he has our best interests in mind. That he knows what he's, what's right for us, what we need. We've tried everything. It kept falling on our faces. But we have a Savior, we have a Lord. 
that knows exactly what each and every one of us needs. How slow and reticent we are to accept this. How quick we are to renounce his lordship in our lives. The Bible speaks clearly, commanding us to do certain things and to abstain from others. And yet, when these commands conflict with what we want, we quickly and unashamedly turn from the lordship of Christ. There are a lot of so-called Christians, people who say they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who say they go to church every Sunday, who listen to Christian radio, who are slowly or have set aside the commands of Jesus because it's the 21st century. And those commands aren't culturally relative. They were good in the past, but they're not good now. Whether it's that excuse or some other equally weak excuse, in reality, by not following his commands, by making, again, an excuse They think that it now gives them the freedom to rebel and disobey. Here's the thing, though. When God, when God's appointed leaders, whether it's husbands, parents, governing authorities, or church leaders, asks us to do that which we disdain, that which we don't like, we reject their leadership, and seek some other leaders who will lead us in the, say, in the way we really wanted to go all along. There may be times that I may be up here and I may say something that, you know what, I, I really don't like the way he, he said that. I think that, you know, the Bible, yeah, it's, it has a lot of good things to say, but, you know, he should kind of skip that part or you know he, he should you know he should really know what's really going on here you know i don't know there could be a number of reasons or why you could be upset but again i just remember i'm i'm just delivering a message this is god's word the beef is that you don't have the beef with me you have the beef with him you got to take it up with him. I'm always going to do that. I'm always going to point you back at, at, at God. If there's something that I read or I say that you don't like. But again, remember that he's trying to tell you something personally through that. He's maybe convicting your heart. And trying to tell you, you know what? You have it all wrong. If you really want me to draw near to you, Again, this is the Lord. If you really want me to draw near to you, let go. Let go of it all and draw near to me. I will embrace you and love you and accept you regardless of who you are and what you've done. But as I just said, a lot of people possibly have already left this church or have left other churches because they've heard or have seen other teachers, other pastors have been to other churches where they hear things or they give them an excuse for their behavior. You love somebody, it doesn't matter what gender they are, as long as you love them. The Bible clearly states that God created a man and a woman to be together, to have, to make babies together in the confines of marriage. 
one man, one woman. But nowadays, again, it, me saying that, a lot of times, a lot of places, it's labeled as hate. In a lot of churches, it's labeled as hate. It's not me. It's the Word of God that says that. When our eyes are no longer on the cross, or when hearts are hard, and we aren't seeking the will of God, we become less inclined to submit to his leadership. So that's where you need to ask yourself, why am I not obeying? Well, ask yourself, am I obeying? And if not, why? Is it because your eyes are somewhere else? Your eyes are looking around all the problems of the world, all the, your own personal problems? Have you hardened your heart? Because of sin, are you no longer seeking the will of God through prayer, through his word, through fellowship? If that's what's going on, then yes, you can be less inclined to submit to God, to submit to his leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, ultimately there's but one leader that we must follow. And that person is our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who reject him do so at their own peril. And someday they will. They will acknowledge him as God's king. God gives all people, everyone, not just Americans, but everyone around the world, the opportunity to trust in Jesus Christ as God's Savior, God's sin bearer, as well as to submit to him as God's King. Those who submit to him as Savior and King are granted the forgiveness of sins and a place in his eternal kingdom. Those who reject him will someday acknowledge him as king, but they will forever be banished from his kingdom, suffering the penalty of eternal doom for their rebellion. The Bible says that there, in that eternal torment, all there is is suffering, weeping, the pain is so intense that you're gnashing your teeth. He, whom God has appointed as our sovereign king, is also he whom God sent as God's suffering servant, who bore the penalty of our sins, and who now offers you eternal life. Submit to him. Submit to him as Savior and Lord and live as his loyal subject for his glory and our eternal good, for your eternal good. If you've never done that, if you've never come to the cross and ask him to forgive you of your sins, in a minute I'm going gonna, gonna to lead you in a prayer to do that. But, again, examine your heart. This is going to be a new change. It's going to change your entire world. I'm not saying that when you do that, you're going to feel a surge of electricity or whatever. You may or may not. But you'll know in your heart that your life is forever changed. The Holy Spirit will come and descend and make his home in you. And you will be born again. You'll no longer be a slave to Satan. You'll no longer be sh shackled to the prospects of eternal death. No, you'll be given freedom. 
because Jesus Christ has redeemed you with his blood. And so if you're ready to do that, you want to be forgiven of your sins, wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and pray this with all your heart and with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins. And that three days later, rose from the grave. I now repent and turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, get a hold of us. We want to help you in your next steps of your Christian walk. We don't want you to feel like you have to go through these first few steps by yourself maybe send you a bible maybe just talk to you pray with you maybe we can help you find a church a good bible teaching church in your area that you can start attending and if you're here locally we want to invite you here in the corner of hondo pass and gateway south our doors will be open to you regardless of what you look like what you've done in the past you know, we want you to feel welcomed here because we know that it's God who changes lives and, and hearts. Thank you. Be blessed. Have a great week. And we'll see you next week. Love you. Goodbye.